She attended the University of San Diego, where she graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in political science. Knowing she wanted to be an attorney, Heidi began working in law offices at the age of 14. After she graduated from USD, she went on to obtain her Juris Doctorate from California Western School of Law, graduating in the top third of her class. During her time as a law student, Heidi concentrated her law studies in the areas of estate planning, tax planning, and corporate business law. She has been serving as an estate attorney for some 18 years now, since 2004. And she is one of our Retirement Association select professional partners for all of our legal presentations. And she's been doing this with us for over 12 years now. A warm welcome now for Heidi Klippel. Go ahead, Heidi. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you everybody for attending this presentation today on estate planning. Uh, for those of you that have an existing estate plan, I promise you, you will walk away learning something new today. And for those of you who don't have an estate plan, the focus of our presentation is gonna be to explain estate planning principles and then talk about some common mistakes people make when it comes to estate planning. So again, thank you all for your time today. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to post them on the chat, or you're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to jump in and ask a question. I certainly welcome an interactive presentation. Chances are, if you have a question, somebody else might have a similar question. So more than happy to answer questions as they arise. So I'm going to start off first with the basics. Uh, probably the most common question people will ask me is, what is an estate plan and do I need one? Typically, an estate plan consists of a trust, a will, a durable power of attorney, and a medical directive. The answer to do I need one depends. Um, if you own real property, then you definitely want to have a trust, and I'll explain in more detail why I just said that. If you have $166,250 or more worth of assets, then you also might want to consider a trust, and I'll explain that more in a couple of minutes as well. So starting with the basics, in the state of California, because all states do have different laws, so today's presentation is primarily focused on California estate planning laws, um, but in our state, once you're 18 years of age or older, you do need to have two documents called a durable power of attorney. And the purpose of a durable power of attorney is it is a legal document where you give permission to a third party to make your medical and or financial decisions if you were to lose your capacity. So once you become a legal adult at age 18, you are now deemed an adult under the law. So the only way a third party could advocate for you and make your financial decisions is if you have a durable power of attorney for financial affairs. So without a durable power of attorney, if I were driving home, I'll say yesterday to not jinx anything from work, and if I were hit by a drunk driver, if I did not have a durable power of attorney, then my loved ones would need to go through a court process called a conservatorship to be appointed my financial advocate. So with Britney Spears being in the news recently, more and more people are starting to hear about conservatorships. That unfortunately isn't probably the best example of the benefit of a conservatorship, but what happens with a durable power of attorney is while I have capacity, I can nominate people that I know and trust that have similar financial values that I have to step into my shoes legally and to become my financial advocate if I were to lose my capacity and couldn't make my own medical decisions. So oftentimes these documents are what are called springing durable powers of attorney, which means those powers only trigger when and if I lose capacity. Sometimes I have clients that come into the office that are of an age and physical um, limitations where they're starting to slow down and they want to start giving those powers effective immediately, even though they have capacity. So you can also write a durable power of attorney to give these powers now, even though you have capacity. If you're, if for example, if I've been diagnosed with an illness that involves diminishing capacity, 
it would be prudent for me to get a loved one involved in my financial affairs so that while I have capacity, I can teach them about my finances and my assets and how I pay my bills, my logins and passwords so that at a later point in time, if I lost my capacity, I would have a loved one in place that I had the benefit of teaching all of that to who could take over the management of my finances when I lack capacity and couldn't do it for myself. So having a durable power of attorney for financial affairs is a very important document. And the courts give that document deference when you lose capacity because you can only complete that document while you have capacity. So sometimes clients will call and they'll tell me that their mom who is you know, 85 years old, who doesn't have capacity needs to have a durable power of attorney put into place and I have the unfortunate job of explaining to them that now that mom lacks capacity, it's too late to put a legal document in place. And the only way that they can get those powers on behalf of their mom is by petitioning the courts and becoming their mom's conservator. So when you become a loved one's conservator, you are under the court's jurisdiction. So you are legally required to account to the court to show them what you're doing on a loved one's behalf. It is a public process, so anything about you and your conservator is part of the public record, so anybody can go down to the San Diego probate court and pull your file and see exactly what your medical diagnosis is and who the person is who's managing your assets. The accounting is also a legally con uh, pri public document, sorry, so anybody can pull that document to see how much money you have, how it's being spent, how it's being utilized. So one downside about going through a conservatorship process is you don't have any privacy with that process because any matter that's before the court is always a public file. Under certain circumstances, you can request that a file be sealed. Uh, generally speaking, not all information in the file is sealed, but the judge does have the discretion to seal information like they did with Britney Spears when you have a matter that is considered of high interest where it would be in the conservatee's best interest for certain information to be kept confidential. But overall, the majority of conservatorships in our state are full public documents. So anybody can pull that information. So you have two different types of durable powers of attorney. You have one for financial and then you have one for medical. So a medical power of attorney has a lot of different names. Sometimes people call it a living will. Sometimes people call it an advanced healthcare directive. Sometimes people call it a durable power of attorney for medical decisions. But all in all, all those different titles refer to this one document. Um, so a healthcare directive is important because if you were to lose the ability to make your own medical decisions, this is the document where you name people to come in and make your medical decisions when you can't make them for yourself. I honestly feel that the medical directive is the most loving document in your estate plan because most of us don't have conversations with our loved ones about whether we'd want to be on life support if a doctor concluded that life support was prolonging an inevitable death. Oftentimes we don't discuss with our family whether we want to be buried or cremated or whether we've even paid for or have made arrangements for our burial and or cremation. We also don't tend to talk to our loved ones about our organ donation preference. Some people want to be organ donors. Some people prefer not to be organ donors. Some people are, are willing to only donate their internal organs and tissues, whereas other individuals are willing to donate their skin to burn victims. And other clients are willing to donate their body to science to be used as a cadaver. So when it comes to organ donation, now that we're in 2021 and with medical advances, there's a lot of different uses that they can make with your body parts, your stem cells, your organs, your tissues. So that's a very important decision for you to make. So when you have a medical directive, that is a very important document because you are putting people that you know and trust in charge of making those medical decisions. And one benefit of doing that is sometimes you can have very well-intentioned people who don't agree on what they feel your matter of care should be. So for example, probably about 40, 20, 30 years ago, I don't remember quite how long ago, but that uh, there was a young woman who was in an accident. Her name was Terry Shivo. And her husband didn't feel that she would want to be on continued life support being that she was in a permanent vegetative state. 
but her parents for religious reasons did not agree with the withdrawal of life support because at that time it was against their religious beliefs. So you had three very well-intentioned people who all very much cared about the welfare and well-being of Terry, but unfortunately, because they couldn't agree on what they thought the best course of action was, they battled all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which if you make it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which not very many cases make it that far, you've spent a lot of time, you've spent a lot of money, and unfortunately, nobody wins, right? So the courts did decide through testimony of a former college roommate that they did not feel that Terry would want to be on continued life support. So the Supreme Court granted her husband the ability to withdraw the life support. And he cremated Terry, which her parents wanted her to be buried. And to this day, I don't think they've been informed as to where her ashes are being kept. So unfortunately, Without an estate plan, you can have very well-intentioned people not agree on what they feel is the best matter of care. But when you have a healthcare directive, because you are picking your first, second, third, and fourth choice of loved ones to step in and be your medical advocate when you can't be it for yourself, you avoid a situation like Terry Shivo, and you have the benefit of letting your loved ones know in advance whether you want to be buried versus cremated or cremated versus buried, and if you've paid for those arrangements, and if so, through whom. So a medical directive does not uh, anticipate all types of medical situations. It only anticipates limited medical situations. But the benefit of that directive is picking the person that you know and trust that can consult with your doctor and make medical decisions as they come up on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you have an estate plan, I do feel it's important when it comes to that one document, the medical directive, that you share it with your loved ones. Because if I were hit by a drunk driver on my way home from work, and if my loved ones had a copy of my medical directive, they can grab their copy of that document and take it to the hospital. And there's language in that document that says a copy will be treated like an original. So if your loved ones do have a copy of your medical directive, it is more likely going to find its way to the hospital and that is when the hospital will take direction from the people listed in that directive and they can step in and make your medical decisions for you. When we did our medical directive, I took our medical insurance cards and I photocopied them front and back because the phone number for the medical insurance company was on one side of the card. The policy number was on the other. So I attached our medical insurance information to our healthcare directives. I also attached all the names and phone numbers of my extended family and close friends that I would want to be contacted if there was an emergency. And I photocopied that medical directive along with the medical insurance and phone numbers. And I keep a copy of my healthcare directive and my husband's in both of our vehicles in the glove compartment. So if either one of us were in an accident, I've got the peace of mind that both of those medical directives along with the medical insurance information and with the phone numbers are in the vehicle's glove compartments. I also gave a copy to our neighbor. I asked him if he ever saw an ambulance in the driveway, if he would be so kind as to give a copy of our directives to the ambulance driver. He's not on our medical directive, so you can share that document with people that aren't named on it. And you can also give a copy of that document to your medical service provider. So your primary physician will happily scan that into your file and any other doctor that you're seeing would happily scan that medical directive into your medical file. So those are your two types of durable powers of attorney. The other question people will ask me is what's the difference between a will and a trust? And that's probably the most commonly asked question that I get asked. So before I answer that question, I'm going to first start off with explaining what happens in California if you died without having a will or a trust. And what happens in our state is when you don't have a document that tells the state of California who you want to inherit, there's a statute called an intestate statute that directs where your assets will be distributed if you died without a will or a trust. So if I died as a single person, the intestate statute would first give all of my assets to my biological and legally adopted children. So if, if I died and if my two children survived me, they would inherit my estate. 
if I didn't have children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, then the state of California would then give my assets to my parents or to my surviving parents, and then to my siblings, including half-siblings, and then to my nieces, nephews, great-nieces, great-nephews. And if we still haven't found a living relative, we're going to give those assets to grandparents, then aunts and uncles, first cousins, second cousins. So under the intestate statute, the state of California wants to give your assets to your closest living blood relatives. So if you're married, your spouse would first inherit and then your children would inherit secondarily. But if you have separate property in the state of California, if you don't have a will or a trust, then separate property will be divided 50-50 between spouse and child if there's only one living child, or it will be divided in thirds if there's more than one child with your surviving spouse getting a third of the separate property and your children getting the other uh, share of the, of the separate property. So the problem with our intestate statute, if you want to call it a problem, is there is an inherent bias in the state against stepchildren. So if I am a second marriage, and if I had two children from my first spouse, and if my husband had two children from his first spouse, and to make the math simple, if we had two children in common, so there's six children in this hypothetical, if I died without a will or a trust, the intestate statute will give all of my community property to my husband. But then when he dies, if he also dies without a will and or a trust, then the intestate statute is going to give all of our assets to his biological and legally adopted children. So his two children from his first marriage will inherit, our two children together will inherit, but my children from my first marriage being his stepchildren are automatically disinherited so they don't inherit. So anytime you're a blended family in California, you do need to have a will or a trust to acknowledge your stepchildren because that is how you can ensure that they will inherit when you pass. Because without having a will or a trust, the intestate statute automatically does not include stepchildren, uh, step parents, any kind of a step family member is automatically not included. So when you have a will, what a will does is that is the legal document where you're telling the state of California who you'd want to administer your estate. That person is called an executor. And you're also identifying who you want to inherit your estate. And those individuals are called beneficiaries. So when you have a will, that does not mean that your estate won't go through a court process called probate. What a will does is it is a legal document telling the state of California who's in charge and who's inheriting. There's two things in our state that determines whether or not an estate has to go through a court process called probate. One is if I died and if I owned real estate, if I had a house, for example, that was titled in my individual name and I died, owning real property that's not titled in a trust at the time of your death will always trigger probate. The other thing that triggers probate is if I had liquid monies in my own name that didn't have a pay on death beneficiary attached to that asset, if all of those types of assets added together exceeded $166,250, then those assets would also trigger probate. So if I had a bank account with $300,000 in my name that didn't have a beneficiary attached to it, or if I had my husband as my beneficiary, but he predeceased me so he's no longer living, and I no longer had a living beneficiary attached to that asset, then because that asset's over the $166,250, that would trigger probate. So probate is a judicially supervised process that occurs when a person dies, when they have real estate that's not titled in a trust, or when they have over $166,250. I don't know where the state of California came up with that number, but that's the number. But if you had assets in your own name that didn't have a surviving beneficiary attached to it, then in those two situations, your estate, at least to those assets only, would go through a court process called probate. So when you go through probate, you're basically showing the court that all the beneficiaries have been notified that a person has died, that nobody's contesting the estate, that all of the bills and accounts, credit cards, and taxes have been paid and filed. 
And once you go through this process with the court, the final step in a probate is the judge will issue an order that allows the assets to be titled into the beneficiary's names after you've shown the courts that you've done your due diligence of paying all the debts of the decedent and that nobody's contesting the estate. The problem with probate in California is one, it's a public process. So if my husband and I both died, I'll say yesterday to not jinx anything, if we both died without a will and a trust, we have two kids that are both minors. So if our estate triggered probate, because probate is also a public process, anybody could pull our file and see how old our kids are, where our kids are living, how much money's they're inheriting, their dates of birth, social security numbers, all of that information becomes part of the public process through probate. So that's one downside to probate. The other downside to probate is that we have a law in our state that says that a probate must be open for a minimum of six months before it can be closed. But on average, because of our court's compacted calendars, most probates average about eight months to a year. When we file a petition to open a probate, on average, it takes about two months before we're able to get that first hearing date and have that court appearance, which grants us the ability to start the process. So probate can be a very slow process, which can be very frustrating for the loved ones, just having to not be able to really do much with the assets in an estate until the probate is completed. The worst part of probate in California is the fees. And what happens with the fees in our state is the fees are predetermined by law and they're based on a percentage calculation of the gross value of the assets. So Suzanne was nice enough to send out a question or a handout that I uh, made that goes through and talks about estate planning. And in that handout, I gave some examples, I think they're towards the back of probate fees and uh, common examples of how much probate can cost depending on how much money you have going through the court process. Um, generally speaking in San Diego County, most probates that we've worked with, the average fee is anywhere from seven to 15 to $25,000, which you heard that right, it's a lot of money. We just finished doing a probate for a client uh, where the probate fee was almost $100,000. So the reason why probate fees are so high is because it's generally going to be triggered when a person dies who owns a house that's not titled in a trust. And because those fees are based on the gross value of the asset, if you take one and a half percent of a house that's worth $900,000, pay that fee twice because the executor is entitled to be paid a fee plus their attorney is entitled to be paid a fee. So that statutory fee gets paid twice. The court filing fees and publication costs are an additional $1,500 on average. So most probates in San Diego County tend to vary between $7,500 to $15,000 on average. And that's why so often so many people will do a trust because when you do a trust and when you put assets into a trust, as long as those assets are in trust or name the trust as the pay on death beneficiary, then those assets avoid probate. And that is why so many people you know have trusts in California. It's not because they're special. It's not because they're important. It's because they either own real estate that they don't wanna have trigger probate when they die, or they have over $166,250 worth of assets. Or sometimes even if you don't own a house or don't have that much money in assets, people will do a trust because they have young children that they want to inherit at a later age. So if I have a will and if I own a house and I die, that house will trigger probate. I get a lot of calls from people who say, I have a will, I assume that's all I need. I wanna make sure that my estate doesn't go through probate. And my next question is always, do you own a house? And if they own a house, then I have to explain them that, to them that having a will isn't enough. You have to have a trust and you have to prepare a deed that transfers title of the house into the trust because the house being titled in the trust is how we avoid probate in California. And sometimes I've seen situations where people will have a trust and their house is not titled in a trust. So it's important to understand that even if you have a trust when you die, if your real property for whatever reason is not in the name of that trust, then that property will still trigger probate. So you can have a trust and still have probate in California. So 
when I became an estate planning attorney, one of the things I did is my grandfather, who was alive at the time, had an estate plan. He had a house in Sun City. And once I figured out how to pull deeds, I pulled the deed to his house and saw that his house wasn't titled in his trust. But I knew from my dad that he had a trust. So I called my dad and I said, dad, I'm concerned. Grandpa's house isn't titled in this trust. And he said, Heidi, I think you're wrong. My dad did an estate plan with an attorney and I'm sure the house is in the trust. <clears throat> Excuse me. So long story longer, it turns out the attorney that my grandfather hired as our matter of practice, didn't title his clients' houses into trust, which legally an estate planning attorney is under no duty to transfer people's houses into a trust. So what this attorney was basically doing is he would do an estate plan and people would think that they had all of their affairs in order. And in the estate plan was a letter from the attorney telling the client that they on their own had to do a deed to put the house into the trust, which most people didn't probably know how to do that. And then when their loved ones died and they called the attorney, the attorney would then break the news to the family that the house not is not in the trust. And then the family probably inevitably would ask the attorney, well, can you help us? And the attorney would say, sure, I'll help you. And what they don't realize is the attorney is basically double dipping because here my grandfather had paid an attorney to do an estate plan thinking he had everything in order, not realizing that because the house wasn't titled in the trust, there would have been a probate when he died. And if my dad and his family hired that attorney, that attorney would have made around eight, eight, $8,500 at the time by representing the family in that probate. So what happens is oftentimes most good estate planning attorneys, when they do your estate plan, will offer as an additional service to prepare a deed to put your house into the trust. So where things can sometimes go south is if you refinance, a lot of people don't realize that when you refinance, oftentimes the mortgage companies will take your house out of the trust for the refi. You have to tell them on that escrow paperwork that you want the house to close back in the name of the trust at the close of the refi. And that's where sometimes people can have a problem of having a trust, but the property is no longer in the trust because they refinanced their house, not realizing that when the house was in the process of the refi, it came out of the trust and didn't get put back into the trust. So for those of you that have taken advantage of these incredibly low interest rates, which many of us have, you should check your property tax bill and make sure that there is an abbreviated name of your trust on that just to make sure that the house is still titled in the trust. Um, if any of you would like, you're welcome to send me an email. We can pull deeds for free so we don't charge people to check title to their properties. But if you have a trust and if you refinanced your house, you want to make sure that your house ended up back in the trust at the, at the close of refi. Uh, so I'd be happy to check title to anybody's house if they'd want us to. I'm happy to provide that service. The other thing that's important to understand is that if you're a timeshare owner, a timeshare is treated like real property in the state of California. So you need to have your timeshares titled into your trust as well. If you own a timeshare, the majority of timeshare companies do all of their deeds internally. So for example, if you have a timeshare through the Marriott, you'd wanna call the Marriott and ask them to retitle your timeshare so it's titled to you as trustee of your trust. And the Marriott can do all of that uh, deed paperwork for you directly. Um, so just to back up, the probably the most important important thing uh, that I want everybody to understand is in the state of California, when you die, it's not having a will or a trust that determines whether or not there's going to be a probate process. It's how your assets are titled at the time of your death that determines whether or not there's a probate process. So if I died and if my house wasn't titled in my trust, then that house will trigger probate, but only that asset is subject to probate. So if my investment accounts are titled in my trust, they are not included in the probate. Only the asset that's not included in the trust has to go before the court. So if I had five different investment accounts titled in my trust, but if my house was outside of the trust titled in my individual name, only the house would trigger probate. Those five investments that are titled in my trust would avoid probate, which is good. So talking about that, when you do an estate plan, you want to make sure that your assets are titled correctly. So the way your assets should be titled is real property should be titled in the trust, timeshare should be titled in the trust, 
If you own property outside of the state of California, but within the United States, you can put real property that's located in any state into a California trust. So if you have, for example, a condo in Hawaii, you can title the condo in Hawaii into a California trust. One asset that can't go into a California trust are assets located outside of the United States. So a lot of our clients have assets in other countries. So if you do have assets in another country, you have to work with an attorney where those assets are located to do a, a, probably something similar to an estate plan here in the United States in that country. So because the United States has no jurisdiction over assets outside of its borders, if you own a house in Canada, you're gonna to have to talk to an attorney in Canada to deal with the distribution of that house when you die. But in the United States, you can have a California state plan holding title to assets in other states as long as they're within the United States. So real property, timeshares titled in the trust. Taxable investments also need to either be titled in the name of the trust or naming the trust as a pay on death beneficiary. So if I have a bank account titled in the, titled in the name of my trust, it will avoid probate. If my husband and I have a joint investment account, but we have the trust named as the beneficiary on that account, that asset will also avoid probate. So you can either take an asset and title it into the trust, or you can keep an asset in your individual or joint name, but have the trust come on as the pay on death beneficiary. Once you have a trust in place in the future, as you acquire assets, you should take title of those assets in the name of the trust. So now that you have a trust, if you're opening up a bank account next week at the new bank that's closer to your house, you should open that account in the name of your trust. The only kind of an asset that you have that won't go through your trust, and this is for tax reasons, are your retirement assets. So for those of you who have an existing estate plan, 10 years ago, all of us estate planning attorneys would counsel our clients to have their spouse as their primary beneficiary if they're married and to name the trust as the secondary beneficiary on their retirement assets because 10 years ago, that was okay. But now fast forward to 2021, you don't want the trust as a beneficiary on any of your retirement accounts because that will create an unnecessary taxable event to the beneficiaries of your trust. So for your 403Bs, IRAs, 401K, simples, any kind of a tax deferred asset, if you're married, your spouse should be the primary beneficiary. And if you have children, your children would be named as individual beneficiaries second. So whether you have three kids getting a third, a third, a third, you would name those three children by name as your secondary beneficiary. You would not name the trust as the secondary beneficiary. So that is a recent change in the law about 10 years ago. Um, talking about tax laws, I've had a lot of clients calling me recently asking me what kind of advice do I have as far as the upcoming uh, potential changes with our tax uh, laws. And Please know that when I talk about taxes, I'm not taking a political position one way or the other. What I've learned over the years uh, with tax laws is even when you have proposed tax changes, until they're actually enacted and made into a law, they always have a chance of being revised or changed. So what I'm encouraging people to do that are calling asking these questions is just to sit and wait and see what ends up happening as far as changes in the tax laws. Because right now there will be changes, but I don't think the current, the currently proposed legislation is still being revised. Um, and today on the news, they announced that there's going to be some significant changes made to the current proposed legislation. So my best advice as far as taxes every year, regardless of who's in office and who's not, is just wait it out until the legislation is enacted so that you know what the laws are and make decisions based on that. Because sometimes I've had people make decisions out of fear or make decisions kind of quickly in anticipation of the laws changing the next year and they sell assets or give a bunch of assets away only to find that what they thought was gonna be enacted into the law was voted down or revised last minute and not enacted. And they gave a bunch of money away that they didn't need to and now they can't get it back. So uh, when it comes to taxes, when you die, there is a tax called a federal estate tax. 
that is a tax that the federal government is able to impose if your net estate exceeds a certain amount of money. That federal estate tax changes every single year. It's become a very politicized topic in recent years, which I find ironic because the government, from what I understand, doesn't make a whole lot of money with this federal estate tax. Uh, most people that have a taxable estate tend to plan around it because if you give monies to charities that would normally trigger the tax, then you can get around the tax by being charitably minded. So it's very easy to not trigger these taxes if you have a large estate that would otherwise be subject to being taxed. So right now in 2021, you can leave $11.4 million tax-free. So if you're married, you can leave $22.8 million tax-free. Next year, that uh, federal estate tax exemption is currently scheduled to go down. Um, I've been practicing estate planning for 20 years. It's not a lifetime, but it's long enough that in the 20 years I've been practicing estate planning, there's been a lot of talk about getting rid of the federal estate tax. There's been a lot of talk about flat taxing this tax. All I've ever seen is the amount of money that you're able to leave at your death increase. So I've only seen that bucket get bigger and bigger. So when I first started practicing law, the amount of money that you could leave federal estate tax-free in the early 2000s was $675,000. So when I was a new estate planning attorney, that was the magic number, $675,000. Fast forward to 2021, the new magic number is $11.4 million. So that tax and the amount that, well, I should say that uh, the amount of money that you can leave tax-free before you trigger the tax is pretty substantial. So most people don't have estates that would trigger the federal estate tax. Um, and then when you die in the state of California, we're one of the few states that do not impose a state estate tax. So some Southern states, when you die, your estate is subject to a state estate tax. Whereas California is one of the few states that when you die, there is no state estate tax. That's kind of hard to say, state estate tax. So there's, so that's the information on the tax laws. Another question people will ask me is, what are the tax ramifications when you die? And if you can believe it, they're actually pretty favorable. So it's actually better for you to give assets to your loved ones at your death versus while you're living. And one of the reasons is, is when you give loved ones assets at death, those assets get what's called a stepped up basis, which means all of the capital gain and appreciation in that asset is forgiven 100%. So I had a lady call me one time and she said that she had one child who was in her 30s, who was the apple of her eye, a good kid, good with money. And she wanted to put her daughter on title to her deed as joint tenants with rights of survivorship because she knew that when she died, if her daughter survived her, the house would avoid probate because anytime you have a joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, when one owner dies, because there's still a surviving owner on title, the property avoids probate at the death of the first owner. So that was what she was hoping to do. She called me and said, I'm not fancy. I don't want to do a trust. A trust sounds complicated. It sounds like that's for fancy people and I'm not fancy. I don't want a trust. I just want to do a deed that puts my daughter on title to my property so that when I die, the house will avoid probate. And I said, well, technically you're correct. If you were joint tenants and if you died first, the house would avoid probate. I said, but here's the problem. When did you buy your house? And she bought her house in the 60s and I believe she paid around $200,000 for the house. And I asked her, what's the house worth today? And she says, well, the house has been a very good investment. At the time of this conversation, her house was worth, I think, around $800,000. And I said, well, here's the thing. If you give your daughter your property when you die, that $600,000 of capital gain is going to be forgiven because it's a gift that occurs at the time of your death. I said, but if you gift that property to your daughter now while you're alive, she takes your tax basis. So that stepped up basis is lost. And she's like, wow, well, that's a significant amount of money. And I said, well, that's one reason why it's usually better for your kids or loved ones to inherit your assets when you die versus while you're living. 
And then I asked her, is your daughter married? And she said, yes. And I said, does she live in California? And she said, yes. And I said, well, do you like your daughter's spouse? And she said, he's okay. Some days I like him more than others. I said, well, if you add your daughter to title to your property, if they were to get a divorce because California is a community property state, I guarantee you he's going to hire a lawyer that's going to try to find an argument to claim that part of that house is his. And she's like, well, that would not be good. And that is one reason why, as a general rule, you don't want to put loved ones on title to your assets. Because anytime you put a third party on title to your assets, not only are you giving up control, but their liability becomes your liability. So if she were to add her daughter onto title to her house, and if her daughter filed bankruptcy, or if her daughter was in a car accident, or if her daughter and her spouse got a divorce, her daughter's liability impacts her ownership. I had another guy call me who he had done a similar thing where he put his son on title to his house. So they were joint tenants with rights of survivorship. And the gentleman calling me was upset because he also thought it would be easier to have his son on title as joint tenants so that when he died, the house would avoid probate. But he was having an issue because he wanted to sell his house because he wanted to move into assisted living because he was starting to have some cognitive uh, impairment and the son said no. So he called me asking, what do I do? And I said, well, this is a real unfortunate situation because once you put your son on the title to your house, he is a co-owner. So the only way you can legally sell your house is if you both agree or if you force a petition by going through the courts, which that's going to cost time and it's going it, to, it's going to take time and cost money. So the other problem, obviously, with putting any third party on title to your house is just agreeing on things. Um, so it's generally better when you own assets to have assets titled in trust and to have your loved ones inherit those assets when you die, because by you being on title to those assets and having them in the trust, as long as you're alive and have capacity, you're in charge of managing all of your finances. And the trust has language in it that says that if you were to lose your capacity, then your successor trustee, once they get a note from your physician with your physician attesting to the fact that you lack capacity to manage your own financial affairs, at that point in time, that is the transition as to when a third party can step into your shoes and be your uh, trustee, which is basically your financial advocate and manage your assets for you. But that's an important nuance in the law because if a successor trustee is managing your assets, their liability does not attach to your assets. So if, if my sister were my trustee and if her and her husband were going through a divorce, he can't try to claim that my assets are part of his assets because she's only managing my assets if I were incapacitated. She's not a co-owner of my assets. And I see that happen a lot. So when people do an estate plan, and we give them homework and advising them as to how they need to title their assets so that the assets avoid probate. It's not uncommon when they go into the bank for the people of the bank to say, well, it's just easier if you add your adult child as a co-owner of your asset, because if they're on title to the asset, they can write checks and they can be your advocate if you lost capacity or died. But the problem with that is I had another client who she had four kids she had a bunch of rental properties and she had one of her four kids who helped her manage those rental properties. So because he helped her manage her rental properties, she and him were on a joint account together. All of her properties were in her trust. Her trust was very clear that she had four kids and she wanted all of her assets to be divided equally in quarters amongst the four kids. But this one bank account that she had was not titled in her trust. If it had been titled in her trust, her trust said equal distributions to all four kids. But the bank account was titled in her name and her son's name as joint owners. So he called me and invited all of his siblings to the meeting and basically said the purpose of this meeting is I want the lawyer to tell you what's going to happen with this bank account. So he showed me his trust. He showed me the properties. Everything was in the trust. So I explained to him and his siblings, the trust says equal distributions. All assets that are in the trust are equal distributions. And then he showed me the bank statement. And the bank statement showed his mom's name and his name, JT Joint Tenants. So then I looked at him and I said, I don't think this is what your mom wanted. I said, based on everything you just showed me, your mom was very clear, four kids, equal distributions. He says, I know that that's what my mom wanted, but this bank account 
is not in the trust. It's in our joint names, which means now that my mom died, I'm the legal owner of this account, right? And I said, yeah, technically you're right. And there was almost $800,000 in this bank account. And I guarantee you, if his mom was sitting at that table, she would have said, son, that is not what I want. And I even looked at him and I said, you know what, do the right thing here. You've got three siblings. I'm sure that your mom would have wanted this $800,000 to go equally between you and your siblings. I said, she probably got some bad advice at the bank. The bank probably told her it was easier to put you on title to the account than to fill out some extra paperwork, putting the account into the trust. But he looked at me and said, but you're basically saying I own this money. And I said, yeah, legally you own this money. And he basically got up and walked out of the room with a smirk on his face, which I'll never forget that meeting. And I felt so badly because I knew that's probably not what his mom intended. So when you do an estate plan and when you do your homework, which is the process of an estate plan where you're changing the title of your assets so that they're in the name of the trust or naming the trust as a pay on death beneficiary. If you have multiple kids or multiple beneficiaries, you want to make sure that you put assets in the trust because the trust is going to give assets equally to all the beneficiaries and not just to some of them. All right. So I see there's a question. I'm going to have. I was just talking about uh, bank accounts and we were talking about taxes. Uh, we also talked about these estate planning documents are confidential and the only document in there that I encourage you to share with loved ones is the medical directive. Um, the other thing I just wanted, to, there's two other things I wanna talk about and then there's some things, some questions in the chat room which are general questions which I can address. but. One common question people will ask me is how often should I update my estate planning documents? Generally speaking, you can go about eight to 10 years before you really need to review the documents because the documents um, are usually good for eight to 10 years after the day that they're push, first put in place. It's the tax laws, ironically, that generally necessitate the documents to be uh, to need to be updated because the language in the documents does become stale, for lack of a better word. So sometimes people are surprised that they have to, you know, kind of treat an estate plan like a car, but it does need a tune up. And generally speaking, you can go about eight to 10 years before you do that. But if you have a significant change in your life, a loved one, uh, death of a loved one, birth of, lo of a loved one, divorce, sometimes things will happen in your life that might necessitate you needing to review and update these documents before eight to 10 years. Um, and generally, people tend to change their successor trustee nominations more often than they change any other thing in an estate plan, which is part of why keeping an estate plan uh, private is a good idea. The other question people ask me quite a bit is who should I name as a trustee? So when you create an estate plan, whoever you choose to make your financial decisions is probably one of the most important decisions you're gonna make. You can have family and friends. That's usually my preference. Usually your family and friends are the most likely people that will be at your bedside and that will be advocating for you. So having them having access to the funds makes sense as long as you're putting people in those roles that you know and trust. There are corporate trustees that are banks that can be a trustee, but banks tend to not want to exercise a lot of discretion. So if you have a situation where maybe you've got a beneficiary who's got some drug addiction and you've got language in your trust giving the trustee discretion to drug test a beneficiary and postpone distributions if a beneficiary is having those types of issues, my experience is most corporate trustees won't roll up their sleeves and exercise a lot of discretion because they don't want to take any chances of getting sued. So uh, there's also private fiduciaries that you can name. They're my preference over a corporate trustee. The nice thing about a private fiduciary is they are more willing to roll up their sleeves and dive in and exercise discretion. You just want to make sure if you're looking at a private fiduciary that you're interviewing them, that you're comfortable with them. You want them to review their doc your documents so that they understand what your documents say and do and that they have no issues with them. So picking a trustee is a very important part of the estate planning process. The other question people will ask me is how do you put an estate plan in place? So 
what we do is when we schedule an appointment, we send clients an estate planning questionnaire. That the purpose of the questionnaire is to give people a feel for the questions that are going to be asked so that they can start thinking about those decisions in anticipation of the first meeting. Then you have an intake meeting, which is basically the Q&A between yourself and the attorney to figure out the best way of, of writing your estate plan. And then we draft documents, we email the drafts to clients, we put everything that's pertinent to the clients and red writing in the draft so it jumps off the page and it's easy to find. Everything in black writing is all the legal language that has to be included in the documents. Then you're generally gonna have a follow-up Q&A meeting to talk about the documents, discuss possible changes, answer any questions. And then you have your signing and notary meeting. So once the documents are signed and notarized, that's when the documents exist. And that's when you get to the second step of this process, which is changing title of your assets so that your assets are titled in your trust. So I did have a question that said, please confirm all bank accounts should be in my trust checking and savings. And the answer to that is you can either put your bank accounts into the name of the trust, or you can name your trust as a pay on death beneficiary. I have another question about this that says, are the benefits of a trust the same in case of people who are living together as friends or should we establish a domestic partnership? So in California, there is no such thing as a common law marriage. So between friends, with all due respect, California doesn't recognize that as a legal relationship. So if you do live together with somebody, even if it is platonic, legally that doesn't establish any rights for the other. I'm not a family law attorney. So if you do have questions about domestic partnership, I would encourage you to talk to a family law attorney. But now uh, domestic partnership is real easy to get into. You just file a certificate with the Secretary of State's office. But to undo a domestic partnership, you have to go through a formal divorce. So if you are in a platonic relationship, I would think a domestic partnership probably is not what you should do. Um, and as far as being beneficiaries on each other's accounts, that's fine. And if you, and it looks like you co-own a condo and we have a jointly owned condo. Okay, so if you co-own a property, there's two ways of co-owning real property in California. If you are joint tenants with rights of survivorship, the surviving owner would own that condo outright when the first owner dies. If you're tenants in common, that's different than joint tenancy. A tenancy in common gives the deceased owner the ability to say who inherits their share. So you might want to revisit the title of that condo just to make sure that it's joint tenancy, if that's what you're intending. And then, Suzanne, there was a question about allowing somebody to rewatch the presentation since it's being recorded. I don't quite. Yes, it will be up on YouTube by tomorrow morning. Great. Okay. So I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about. So